and tellurium, which is our metalloid. We then also have polonium and livermorium. It's kind of a mouthful, livermorium, which are both metals. Now, oxygen is relatively reactive, so it can combine with almost every other element on the table which is pretty cool and you find it in a lot of compounds. You also are going to find it written as that diatomic molecule with itself. Our next family are the halogens. And as we have continued to move to the right across the periodic table, we've gotten to more of the non-metals. So this group actually has four elements that are non-metals, the fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine are all non-metals. It has one metalloid astatine and the only metal here is one of those that we theoretically can see that it should exist and be able to predict that it exists but we have not um, necessarily been able to make them in the in the laboratory environment and been able to form them our metal here in this case actually has not necessarily been named it's right now called un unseptium and the atomic masses um, are unstable in those. So the unstable isotopes means that that is why we have not been able to form those in the lab. Um, these are very reactive and are often bonded with elements in group one. As we pointed out before, we have sodium chloride and potassium chloride, which we use as salt and salt substitutes. And there are many other examples of that between those two groups. They are in group 17 and another interesting little fact about these. Um, they're always com found combined in nature but they are used as disinfectants and also to strengthen teeth. You have fluoride in your toothpaste and that is what you probably most commonly associate it with. As I mentioned before, these are very reactive, volatile, dom diatomic, and most of them are non-metals. Like I said, our only metal in that group is one that they have not been able to form. It's just so um, unstable. The isotopes of it are so on. And here we have them. They do have seven valence electrons, which is really close to the eight that keeps an element stable. We know from our discussion with our electron dot diagrams and, and drawing those um, electron levels and configurations that they like to have eight and they can share or they can donate or accept all those electrons and very close with seven but not quite the eight that we're looking for leading to their volatility. Um, we can see over here our halogen family we said fluorine chlorine bromine iodine astatine and our un unseptium they are the one unique thing here is that we have a solid a liquid and a gas at least one of each in this family so fluorine and chlorine we're going to find our gases at room temperature iodine and astatine are solids and bromine is actually a liquid and they have those seven valence electrons, as we mentioned again before. We have our non-metals, our metalloid, and our one metal that is not able to be produced in the lab. Very volatile, always found combined with other elements in nature. And it's interesting that they're so volatile, but they're also heavily used in compounds that are useful for us, especially fluorine, which, like we said, we think about tooth decay, but that is also... Fluorine is used in a compound that makes up the non-stick coating on our cookware, so yet another interesting and useful uh, form of fluorine. Our second to last group here are the noble gases, and we call these inert gases because they have those eight valence electrons, so their outer electron shell is full which makes them very stable. They also all exist as gases, and that is the only family that you're going to see that in. Um, helium only has two electrons in its outer shell and it is considered full, but once you go on from that, you'll see with 10, then we have two in the inner, eight in the outer, and that works its way out. These are not reactive with other elements, and like we said, they are all gases. Um, they are used 
in, this is group 18, so we, there's eight valence electrons. They are used in lit neon signs. Um, they are used in blimps. That's where we were able to fix the Hindenburg problem so we did not explode, explode again as well. Another way to think about these is they're always found free in nature. They do not form compounds. Um, xenon compounds have been formed, but they are very unstable. And so as opposed to being diatomic, as many of our other elements need to be in order to be stable, they are monoatomic or monatomic, meaning that they can be just one of them. We have colored them a bright pink color. We have those eight valence electrons. We can see those guys out there. Once again, we have helium, neon, argon, krypton, xenon, radon, and then our one that has not necessarily been found or confirmed yet, but it's just been predicted that it will be there. They are all gases. They are all nonmetals. They're extremely stable, and they are least reactive due to that full outer shell. Our last group is the rare earth metals, and those are those two rows at the bottom that you see that um, have been pulled out basically to make room for them. Like I said, they are found at the bottom. Um, they are considered metals, and we have the lanthanides, which are in the top row, and compounds containing neodymium, which is a in the lanthanide series. Um, is used to make laser lights, and these are the types of lasers that are used for surgery, for cutting metals, and then laser range finders. And the, the row below those are actinides, and many of these elements are not found in nature, but can be made artificially in the laboratory. And so since those have some different properties, they pull those down there and make some room up in those transition metals. But they are considered metals, and we can call them rare earth elements or rare earth metals. These rare earth metals, um, some of them are radioactive. They are silvery to silvery white or gray metals. They do conduct electricity.